All right, what's up, Mike? What's going on? All right, man, so um, thanks for being here, bro, but uh, we already talked about what we're gonna talk about, so um, let's just start off, you know, tell me where you're from and, uh, and your upbringing, a little bit about your upbringing. Um, so I was born and raised in uh, South Central, South Central Los Angeles. Um, I'm the youngest of, of three kids. So I have an older brother and then an older sister. Uh, so yeah, we're raised in, in, in LA. Uh, single mom, single mom. Uh, my dad was kind of there off and on a little bit, tried to be, but uh, he, he dealt with a lot of stuff, a lot of issues, drugs, alcohol, rest in peace. He's no, no longer here. So it was my mom and us and... Uh, when did your dad die? Uh, some years back, recent. I was an adult when he died uh, from, of all things, uh, alcohol, alcohol poisoning. Kind of ripped a hole in his uh, intestine and leaked out, and he died. Mm. Uh, which was pretty tough for me. Like you would, you would think it wouldn't be because he was never there, but that was something to deal with. Um, but yeah, so growing up, it was, my mom had my grandfather. He was a big part of my life. And then my brother, obviously, my older brother, pretty much who I looked up to. But um, So your mom pretty much raised you? Yeah, it was, it was her. And then when she wasn't there, because she was working full time, it was my, my brother and then my, grand, my grandparents. So, What city did you grow up in? Uh, I was in L.A. and uh, during a... So I was born in 81, so during the 80s, so you, you probably can imagine, um, drugs was crack, cocaine was at, at probably at its height and coming, you know, kind of climbing by the time I was hitting that, that age where, you know, you start to understand things. Gangs was huge in the neighborhood where I grew up. I was in one of the, uh, it's, not, it's not a lot of blood gangs in LA, but the blood gang that where I was at, there's like these this blood neighborhood that I live in, and then around it is all Crips and a couple of um, Hispanic gangs. So that was that was something we had to contend with, had to deal with. How did you manage to stay out of a gang? Um, you know what? Well, my brother was a big part of that, big influence on that. Uh, kind of wouldn't let me hang out, and uh, believe it or not, that. A lot of the dudes I still keep in, keep in contact with, but um, these guys, I guess you would say, not that I was special or that my brother was special, but they kind of saw that we, we, you know, we were a little different, focused on like school, and they were, were kind of like, nah, you can't do this. You, know, you need to go over there instead of... Um, but my mom kept, kept us busy. I rode horses growing up, believe it or not. A lot of people were like, you rode horses in L.A.? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I rode horses. <laughs> uh, I did karate. Um, did some different things. School was a nerd, academic decathlon. <laughs> 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 so I did, did some different things. Basically just, you know, stay busy. Um, so uh, you're a former Marine, is that right? Yes. Um, what inspired you to go to the Marine Corps? Um my grandfather was a big part of that uh, because he was he's a Korean War veteran and he always talked about the army and his experiences and I was, so from a young age I knew I was going to join the service I didn't know where but then my brother joined the Marine Corps in 95 I would think I was in like the 8th grade I don't remember what grade ninth grade or something but as soon as he joined I knew it was like that's it I'm joining the Marines and there was nothing, you know, anybody could, could tell me. They tried to talk me out of it. My grades were good. Yeah, I could have went to college, but I'm like, nah, you know. All right. So it sounds like your brother was uh, maybe a role model in your life, huh? Yeah, big one. Big one for me. Kept me out of trouble. <laughs> what was your job in the Marines? Uh, I did a few things. Um, my primary job was a, as a machine gunner, infantry. Um, I did that. I did... Um, I was a, um, call it a Marine, I don't want to say Marine security guard, but that's what it was, like security forces, basically, um, where, you know, I stood guard on a Navy base, guarding nuclear weapons, and then I was a, a recruiter. 
but uh, the but the, the main one was you know my my primary job was as a machine gunner uh, in infantry. So um, and, and that that's basically um, the infantry guys are the you know the, the front line guys. When when something happens, if you're infantry, you're you're up front and for. What I did, I, the heavy machine guns. So when you see those movies with these big guns or or whatever, that's what I did. It's like I had 50 cows and uh, Mark 19s, which is a grenade launcher. And um, in my company, the unit I was in, we actually took those guns and put them on the back of jeeps. So <laughs> I was in a helicopter company. So everything we did, we we went in on a heli- all our training. We're on helicopters, and I hate heights. <laughs> but I didn't really have a choice. But so we flew in, you know, you flew in, fly here, fly there. The Jeep drives off. You have this machine gun on the back and shoot at the target or whatever it is. So, um, Can you talk a little bit about what life was like in the in the Marine? What, what a typical day was um, doing what you did? Um, I mean, I did several different things, but um, I think the one that, that people most kind of the, the ones the one thing or the one job I guess people most know us for or kind of hone in on is the, the infantry thing um, so like that a typical day in the infantry you wake up in the morning probably five o'clock in the morning six o'clock in the morning whatever um, eat eat breakfast if you choose to eat breakfast at the nasty nasty ass little dining hall and then you go and you go work out or PT. So we'll go typically out. You go for a run, whatever that is. You go run, go maybe lift a little weights, come back, shower, change, and then you'll go train. So you work on different skill sets. And for me, when I got to my unit, we were doing workups. We were preparing to go overseas. <laughs> and we kind of knew we were, there were like uh, whispers of war. So we kind of knew what we were going to do. Where were you stationed? I was at Camp Pendleton, which is Southern California, close to, oh, well, it's in Oceanside, it's like an hour north of San Diego, maybe an hour, depends on how fast you drive, <laughs> an hour south of, of, of Los Angeles. So I was there, with, and Camp Pendleton has its own weather system, because it'd be raining one day, and, but, so we did, you know, we would train, or you would go to the field for, you know, weeks at a time, and the field being... You're uh, you're sleeping outside under the stars in the dirt, and you're cold and hungry. You know that's just the the life of a of an infantry marine, basically. And um, uh, what was that like? How long would you stay in the field at a time, sleeping outside like that? Um, well, you would you're you're in the field for for a, a week or a couple weeks at a time during during the workups and. And a workup is uh, this is when you're pre- you're preparing to. Uh, I'm sorry, workup. So you're preparing to go overseas. So you're going overseas. I went on a on a boat on a navy boat. They gave us a ride, but we're preparing to go overseas. So during the workups, you do you do you have certain um, certain types of training you have to do to be to be qualified to even for your unit to go on this deployment. So during these during these trainings, you're doing things where you're you're preparing to do. Maybe humanitarian services where you're handing out food. Um, you have to be able to do like special operations capable, which means you can um, go and, and board ships and do things like that, or maybe go into like different towns, or you know, you're dealing with either even like as a you know, like I said, I was in a helicopter company, so you'd have to be able to pass um, some tests that they you know the the headquarters, the you know, the big wigs had these certain marks that you had to be able to do, and that that's what the workup is. And it also the purpose of it is to get guys on the same page, that cohesion. So once you know, once you're overseas or in a different country or whatever it is, you kind of things are second nature. They know you can hand out food on this block and then on the next block, kind of engage the enemy with. You know your weapons or whatever so th- that was the whole focus of, of the workup and getting getting you ready basically getting you ready for for war the main purpose of infantry marine is to fight a war and 
you know, I mean, that's uh, the mindset of a Marine in general, but the infantry Marine, everything that, that we did was centered around that, you know, it's kind of like, you know, any job, I guess you, you prepare to do your job and we didn't know what we were going to be, if we're ever going to go to war, if we were, if we weren't, but regardless, that's what we train for every day in infantry. So, so basically it sounds like, um, as an infantry Marine, uh, you're trained to kill. Is that right? Basically that, I mean, that's your, that's your whole, that's your whole purpose is, is to, there's a, the, 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 the mission of the Marine is the mission of the Marine Corps rifle squad, but it's in essence, it's the mission of the infantry Marine is to lo locate the enemy and close the distance between you and the enemy and kill them, destroy them. And that's been the Marine, that's, that's been the Marines mission from day one since they were established in 1775. The Marines started out to, you know, kill. They so put, put them on these boats and hey, kill these guys. When you were doing this um, workup, um, you said, you mentioned that there was whispers of, of, of war potentially. Um, what was the talk going around um, how were people feeling, uh, you know, what was the, what was the tone like? Um, well, it, you can see it on the, the news. A lot of things were building up in, in the Middle East with Iraq and with the president at the time, George Bush, who kind of knew he, he had a, no secret, this guy had a chip on the shoulder for, for Iraq, for Saddam, and he's kind of unfinished business with his dad. So... That was kind of like bubbling up, but um, on, a, on my level with the Marines, um, guys were kind of anxious, I guess, about it. I mean, we you join the Marine Corps, you sign up for infantry, nobody makes you do it, right? So you, you sign up with the hopes, the majority, I would say, the hopes of going to war. So you, I think I was 21 at the time and didn't really get care too much for news or politics or whatever. I didn't care what was right or what was wrong. I was an infantry Marine. So I was like, hey, I just want to go. I want to go fight. Like, this is what I've been training for. So that was kind of the move. But it was a kind of a mortality to it where you're like, well, damn. You know, you, you hear the history of, of the Marines and guys going to war and people legs getting blown off and people getting killed. So you're like, damn, that could be me too. But the desire and the, the hunger, that's what I'll call it, it's weird, but the hunger and desire to go to war was, was stronger than the, the kind of soberness of the possibility of dying or being killed. So, And um, when you were doing this workup and, uh, you know, with the, pop, with the potential of going to combat, um, uh, are, were you in any relationships, any kids to think about? You know, talk to me about that. Yeah, I was, uh, I was married at the time. Um, and I had... Um, so I have three kids. At the time, before I left, I had two. And uh, my son, my middle son, he, had, he, was just, he was born in October. I left for my deployment in January. So you can imagine my son wasn't that old. He was a, what, a couple months. I'm not good at math, but... October to January, right? Math for Marines. But, um, so that was something to think about. It's like, okay, I'm leaving. Deployments were six months and I'm leaving and might not come back. So that was something to think about, right? Um, and again, that was a part of like the, the mortality of it, like where you kind of, it brings you back to, I guess, to be, to normal. Because it's not normal. Like, if you ask the average person, they wouldn't, the average person wouldn't want to be like, oh, a war? Okay, yeah, send me, right? Like, a, a, an infant, infantry Marine would be. But it was kind of hard to balance that, you know, because on the one hand, I'm like, when my, when my guys are like, yeah, we're ready, and whatever comes our way, and then go home, and with my then wife and kids, and they're like, oh, we don't want you to leave. But they couldn't understand why. It was something that I felt like I wanted to do or had to do. So that that was tough. But 
Uh, family, same thing. You know, people were kind of worried too. So, um, so you ended up going overseas, right? And um, when did you find out you were going in the combat? Um, do you remember? Uh, you know, was it announcement? Did they do a formation? Um, I don't know if you could if you could recall finding out or getting that announcement. What was that like? Um, I don't remember. Excuse me. I don't remember exactly when. I mean, we were pretty. We were like honestly before I even got on the boat to leave. We were like eighty percent sure we were going to um, going to war. You know, we could tell by. Just kind of the way they, because normally, sorry, normally they, um, you go to certain ports. They were like, no, we're not going there. We're going to go here. We're going to go straight, <laughs> straight to the, to the, um, Persian Gulf or whatever. But I think we were on ship when they told us like, Hey, we're going to, we're, I'm sorry. We're in Kuwait. I do remember we're in Kuwait and we were sitting. We had a big bonfire with all the um, the seniors. We call them the seniors, or the the platoon sergeants. We were all out there hanging out, and then that's when they told us um, that we were we were going. We we're going to be going into Iraq. Um, but we kind of, I mean, we again, there were there were clues. Like the writing was on the wall because we had CNN um, reporters and embedded with us in Kuwait. And that's not normal for a deployment. Like normally you'll have your, because there are a million different jobs in the Marine Corps, you have your Marines that their job is to take pictures. That's what they do. But we had (laughs) civilian media with us. So we knew like, well, something up, but. So how did that make you feel? Um, You know, how did you feel when you knew for sure you were getting ready to go into combat? Um, You know, did you get an opportunity to, talk to your family at all your kids before you went or what was that like um you know what it was it was it was sobering because initially again you have all these thoughts like yeah i can't wait and then it goes it went automatically went to well damn am i ready for this and you know i was a, a sergeant so i was in charge of marines and i'm like am i ready for this for for myself can i can i lead these guys through what's about to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but, and I didn't, I didn't get to, we weren't allowed to call home or write home and be like, Hey, we're going to war. They pretty much, they found out from watching uh, TV, but it was, it was a sobering moment. It's kind of just like, Oh shit. Like it's really, really happening. And then we started, they said we train, you know, you're constantly training, right? For, for combat or whatever. But then after that announcement, we started training for specific missions where we would lay out um, certain, like how a building may be laid out that we may be going into or an area. And and that's when it was really like, it's kind of like a dress rehearsal pretty much. We try to kind of imitate where we're going like rebuild it and, and that was like oh shit like this is this is really about to happen so do you remember your first can you recall your first day landing in iraq um how did you get there uh yeah i remember <laughs> the first day is funny we we flew because i'm a heli- we're in a helicopter company so we flew in through we're in the, we came up in the south and um we're a little city called Umkasar. It's like a, not like a port. Well, it is a port, not kind of like a port. So that was our objective. And we flew in through the south, and I was in what a um, a, a CH um, fifty three, a super stallion. So these things open. They're big, massive helicopters to carry our again my our jeep and our guns. And we flew in. It was surprisingly during the daytime and landed and the ramp when we landed the pilot i don't know what happened but he landed too hard and broke the ramp broke 
so it wouldn't open. So like we're sitting now in enemy territory or whatever, and we can't even get out. <laughs> like so, that, I was like, "Oh man, is this how this thing is gonna go? We can't even, we can't even get out." So I mean, eventually they we we got we got out, and it was just a rally point, and there was nobody around. Thank God. But so, what was it like being there? What was it like being in Iraq? Um... In it, initially, it was it was surreal, you know, because you're like, okay, I'm I'm finally here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in combat, right? Because Marines, that that's what we want. Like, I'm, I'm here. I'm in combat, and it was surreal. But, you know, like we're we we're convoying or going up to our first objective, and there's there's nervousness. You don't know what's what's going to happen or what's going on, and then. Um, like the initial, like the first firefight, we're driving our jeeps. We're in the back of the company, and you hear shooting up front. So we go up, and uh, we're in that that first firefight, and that was that was that was crazy, you know, because the the thing with it is, um, for me, I can't speak for everyone, but before and after. Uh, a firefight is a, the worst because before you're like, damn, I might die. What if this? What if that? But the thing about the Marine Corps and infantry specifically is all the training that you did that you're, you know, we're out there and any infantry Marine will tell you in the middle of the night, middle of the day when you're training back here in Camp Pendleton, you're complaining. You're like, this shit sucks. I learned that it paid off because in that in that moment, however long it is. Your training kicks in and you're not thinking about, you don't have time to be really be, I guess, worry about what might happen. You just kind of return fire or do whatever. And that's what happened. And then after it was over, it's like, damn, you start to remember like maybe a bullet that was hitting the dirt over here or whatever. And then you think about what could have happened. But, um, <laughs> so you know, why there's bullets, you know, flying your way, like, um, it sounds like maybe you have an adrenaline dump, huh? Like, uh, I mean, what did it feel like? Did, did like, your training kick into play? Um, you know, what was the reaction? Did everybody know what to do right away? Uh, because you're around a bunch of people, uh, Marines that, you know, most probably haven't been to combat before, right? Right. No, none of us had been to combat. I mean, minus like, our, my platoon sergeant, he had some combat experience. Um, and maybe there, there was, in my platoon, he was the only one with combat experience. So the other, the other, you know, staff sergeants and, and those guys had experience from maybe um, Kuwait back in the day or Somalia or whatever. So, but the rest of us, we were just like, <laughs> you know, we're just going off of our training and no experience. And um, the, the group of guys I were with, they were solid. We were all pretty tight and it was a solid group. During that engagement, everybody did what they were supposed to do. Even the young guys, we did, we had one guy and I, I won't call out names. I don't know who will see this, but we had one guy, and he was a um, he was a sergeant. He he had Marines under his charge, right? And so this was one of my fears before we came: was like, am I worthy? You know, do I have what it takes to lead lead these guys? Anyway, in this f firefight, this guy um, coward, I guess hit he hit behind it's not funny but it's just kind of like you just don't know i guess you know you just don't know what what you're going to do how, you, how you're going to react and that dude it, i don't know it's like you train that's all you train for and then you get in that situation and you can't do it. it's kind of like if i worked at Domino's to, and I trained at the Domino's Pizza Academy and then when it came time to it I couldn't make the pizzas like okay then you're useless to me so what did he do he, he, he just he stood back and he, hit or he froze he just sat 
kind of sat behind the, the truck while the young guys, his guys, they knew what to do. They, I watched them. They got into, did their thing, deployed their machine guns, and they handled business. And then, you know, him. So, you know, guys just react differently. And it's funny because before we went, he was he was one of the guys that would kind of uh he was like a hard ass and he would talk talk shit like oh man i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna do that i'm like bro have you ever been shot at no but i'm like okay it's a little different when you get because you know growing up not saying that that this makes me gives me any type of experience or any kind of whatever but growing up in the neighborhood i grew up in the time i grew up i've been shot at several times and I knew it was no fun at least this time I would have a gun to shoot back but I would like dude do you even know what you're gonna do like you ever been shot at no but I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that and he did the complete opposite so they ended up pulling him out of kind of the whole rotation pretty much for the rest of the time there he wasn't even allowed to go out go on patrols He's a sergeant, and they had this guy opening and closing gates for the vehicles. They had him. The stuff you see in the movies, the 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 shit in a diesel can. <laughs> they had him burning, like that's a job for new new guys. And they were like, "You're useless." Burning shit. Yeah, like you shit. <laughs> you you they they cut a a a barrel, a metal barrel, cut it. They put diesel fuel in it and then they stick it underneath a piece of wood with a hole in it and you go piss shit guys go and then once it gets full they drag it out and light it on fire and burn the shit if you're a new guy (laughs) hey buddy go burn that shit (laughs) but they had this sergeant you know this guy is you know one of the senior guys doing it but he so was a, so after um, after that initial firefight um, in Iraq, what happened after that? Uh, Can you just talk to me about some of the things you saw in Iraq? Um, um, you know the families out there. Um, just anything that you could vividly remember, recall. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of families. And so the, I ended up in a city called Al Nazaria. And um, it was pretty shitty for many reasons. But um, that's where they had Ambush Alley, right? Yeah, Ambush Alley, yeah. And that's where um, Jessica Lynch was at. So my unit ended up being a part of that thing, the, the girl that got captured or whatever. But. The city, it was pretty shitty the way, just the way people were treated. Um, so the way, the way you, you kind of view things as an infantry, infantry Marine going into combat, you want to hate everybody. Like, you feel like the only way I can do my job is if I just fucking hate these people. But then you get there and you see that there's women, there's kids. And then that that compassion, you're the, you're a human, so you're like, damn, right? So you you know, seeing that, I had stand at a checkpoint. I'll never forget. This lady came up to me, and she's holding a this kid had to be maybe a year old, and she's trying to hand me this kid. This kid is dead. I don't know how the kid died, why the kid was dead. She's trying to hand me this kid, this dead kid, and I'm like, I can't do anything for you. And at the time, it, it kind of it struck me because, again, my son was born in October. I deployed in January, and now it's March, and I'm in Iraq. So my son is not that old. And here, this lady, so I'm just kind of, it's hard to separate that. No matter how much training you do and how many times that you yell, kill, kill, it's like, you can't separate that. Was the kid in any, like, covered up or? Naked. Just butt naked. Naked, naked kid. And, you know, there were kids that would come up and they had wounds and bruises. And you're like, what is this from? You know, but they would, and that was from shrapnel, from bombing. Who knows if it was our bombs, their bombs, whatever. 
And one of Saddam's things, one of his uh, tactics in these cities, when, you know, these guys, they didn't get enough guys to, to volunteer for his army, he would shut off water and power. So you got these people running around, they have no power, there's no water. And the biggest thing, the thing that stuck with me most like, it is the kids. You know, I had standing at a checkpoint, another lady came up with a kid. And he, his, his leg was bandaged up. And I'm like, okay, well, at least he's... And she opened it, the bandage, and there's worms, like, crawling everywhere. And that, like, for me, like, adult, I'm be honest. Like, I can see it when I, you know, there, seeing it, a dude, a, you know, older guy, whatever, dead, whatever, didn't really bother me so much as seeing kids I guess maybe because I have kids or whatever and then you would see guys with their ears chopped off left ear right ear whatever and you start you know we were in Nazaria for a minute so you start building relationships with people and come to find out the reason why their ears are chopped off is punishment because maybe they didn't want to do this or do that they didn't want to volunteer for the army. Um, so that was, you know, um, tough. And uh, for me, you know, and I don't, I don't talk. <laughs> this is it's crazy because I don't, I, you know, I normally don't, I don't talk to people about my experiences or, 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 um, what I saw or what bothered me, I guess, because there's guys that have buddies that went back to Fallujah and who knows, right? Everybody processes things differently. But for me, it was the kids. But the worst for me, my worst experience by far when I was there and I was in Nazaria, um, we're driving around doing our patrols and our during the daytime, we're near this hot, the same hospital that uh, they they kept they were keeping Jessica Lynch when all those those army guys got kidnapped in the beginning of the war. They were convoying through there. If you don't remember, they're convoying through there. Sandstorm. They get ambushed, and a bunch of them get kidnapped. And then they send Marines and Navy SEALs to go and rescue some of them. Anyway, we're driving patrolling in that same area, and so there's I had a couple little I call them friends. These little kids I would give food to and talk to and one of the kids is like mister he came to me and that's how the kids typically addressed you over there they call you mister 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 he gets my attention and he's like your friends and he's like pointing to a field and i'm like what the fuck are you talking about your friends your friends come on mister come on your friends so i'm like looking look at my my guys that i'm with and they're like let's go so we were driving, we were following his kid, and I'm like, dude, we're gonna drive over a landmine, or he's gonna, it's a setup. But he's like, he's pointing at the dirt. Your friends, and I'm like, you could see like a piece of plastic hanging out the ground. So we start digging. I grab a shovel, start digging, and pull out more plastic, and it has like blood on it. And I'm like, okay, this is fucking weird. And then I pull out. A uh, one of our it's called a mop suit. It's the things that we wear to protect us against like chemical agents. But it wasn't a marine mop suit. It happened to be um, army. And I'm pulling this out, and then you can start smelling the dead bodies, and I'm like, fuck! Like I had to stop. Um, automatic right away. I knew what it was, and so. For me, like that was the worst thing. It's like digging up. I'm digging, digging up um, fellow Americans, like fighters, like soldiers, like my. And I'm like, fuck, that could be me. like they lit, just took these people and just fucking threw them, and the grave was maybe three feet deep, and that's what they were worth. And that, like, to this day, that's something that 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 I deal with. You know, it's not like, you know, I know, you know, guys, I've heard stories. I, as a recruiter, I talk to these 
you know, Marines, World War II veterans and some of the stuff that they saw and did. But for me, that was it. I'm like. <laughs> so you had to dig up your own people from the ground and pull them out. Uh, yeah, like I got. I stopped. We got to a point where you you knew what it was. And then I'm like. Uh, it was it was bothering me, and I didn't know how it was affecting my Marines. So I'm like, hey, no, nope, we're done. We just fucking radioed in, and then, um, and then they came in. They had whatever, and they finished it. And that's something like. So I I go to when I talked to my therapist. Uh, one of the things was. Maybe find out their name. So you Google it and, you, you know, try to find out the names of these people to kind of bring some type of closure. But I just feel like that's one of those things, you know, between the kids and that, you know. Um, let's talk about, um, you know, how was life in the Marines after you got, well, first off, if, uh, what was life like in the Marines? Because you stayed in for a while, right? After that first tour of combat? Yeah, I did. Eight years total. So you did another stint? Mm-hmm. Um, what was life like for you um, after being in combat like that? Um, initially, when I... So... <laughs> It's funny. I'm la- I mean, it's not funny, but so you go, you, you go to war, right? And you, <laughs> all right, guys, pack your shit up, get back on the boat. We're gonna fin- finish our deployment. You get on this boat after you know whatever. Everybody processes things differently. Anyway, you, you <laughs> bunch of Marines, macho Marines. And they put you all in one room and the chaplain comes in. Anybody want to talk about how they're feeling or what they saw? I'm like, of course, fuck no. Like, I'm not about to sit here and, and tell you guys that seeing this kid bother me or seeing this bother me or whatever. So I was like, no. So like right away it was suppress whatever. If you knew it was there or not, it was suppressed, which I didn't know. But the rest of the time in the Marine Corps was kind of like, um, it was t- when I got home, I, um, some of the stuff I don't, I personally don't remember, but my, my, then my wife at the time would tell me about, um, dreams you know, waking up, like kind of how I was in my sleep and waking up and doing things that I never did before in my sleep. Um, I do. What, what kind of things? Awake, like just suddenly waking up, sweating, uh, making noises, um, yelling, screaming. Um, some of the stuff I do remember. I mean, she remembers it more clearly than I do, obviously, because she was sleeping next to me. But um, I do remember like a reluctance to really want to like be around people, be in crowds. Um, which is that's still probably one of those things I kind of. So this is that this is when you got out of the Marines, right? Well, this is this is when I got home from combat. Yes, like shortly after. Oh, but you're still in the Marines. Still in the Marine Corps. Okay. Still in the Marine Corps, and so it was pretty intense for like the first maybe year I got out, and then it kind of all right. I think got back, I guess, normal or whatever. I ended up um, getting sent to be a recruiter in some small town in, in Pennsylvania. And that was the last thing I did in Marine Corps. That helped me, I guess, I would say transition from being a Marine. I'm, it was easier because I, as a recruiter, you're living in just like a regular civilian, right? You're living in the city. So that made it the transition a little easier, I think. 
Um, you know, coming back and thinking about, you know, the kids, your friends being buried or, or you know, other Marines. Um, how does it feel to be in an environment, right, still being in the Marine Corps where it's not popular, you know, or, you know, for lack of a better term, to talk about something like that because um, you're supposed to still, I mean, you're still a Marine, right? You're supposed to be this big, tough guy. Um, nobody thinks you could, you're supposed to feel like this. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Well, well, looking back now, I, I mean, if you would have asked me about this then, I, in 2000, whatever, six, five, so I wouldn't have an answer. But looking back, um, you're right. You're like you have this thing where you know what I have to be tough. I can't talk about this shit, and or you you know you kind of make excuses for no, it's not. It's not. I don't feel that way because of that. You know, it's because of whatever I'm whatever job I'm doing. That's why I'm stressed out, or my family. That's why I'm stressed out. But for me, it repressing those things made me push people away. Um, and not community, just basic things, holding hands. I don't, I don't want, I just don't want, don't be around me. I don't want to be around you. So that's kind of like the, it's like a, like a grenade basically, right? Like you, you're exploding inside, but everybody around you, they're affected by it because you can't talk about it or you won't talk about it. And, but it manifests in different ways, maybe in the way you communicate or don't communicate or the way you spend time and, you know, things that you do. Maybe, you know, some guys drink more, some guys do whatever, but um, it definitely had an effect on, on relationships for me and close relationships. Did it affect your marriage at all? Absolutely. 100%. It did. 100%. Um, Communication was, that was pretty much like, that was pretty much done. Um, because it's like, I feel like, I already had a tough childhood with, you know, growing up without the dad. That was already something I had to deal with that I never dealt with, had never, hadn't dealt with, right? So I already have, so now you're adding shit on top of shit and it just, now you have this and you feel like, uh, you, are you going to judge me if I tell you about, you know, this situation over there, what I saw, or if I tell you this and I don't want to be judged or you, uh, you just won't understand. So it, it goes from that to you just, you're not talking. And then my marriage for sure deteriorate, deteriorated. Um, are you guys still married? No. Um, would you say that that has something to do with, uh, the aftermath of being in war? Absolutely. I would say that just again, like you just feel like, um, well, for me, I don't know how yeah, people are different, but for me, it was like, I have to like stay behind this wall. I have to be tough because if I talk about this, I'm going to look a certain way. I'm going to look weak or I'm going to look whatever. And again, I just added and it was just like, oh, we're not, I'm not going to talk to you. And we just stop talking and then little fights become big fights because there's frustrations from other things. And uh, when I think about it, and you know, even through therapy sessions, you know, talking to therapists and looking back and taking inventory of everything. They're like, yep. Like, yeah, you, you know, obviously no marriage is perfect, but like, yep, right here is where you, <laughs> when you draw a timeline, you start to see like these things affected you. Um, have you been diagnosed with PTSD? Yes. And, um, Talk about, you know, some of the things you have to deal with 
um, maybe some of the feelings you have when you go out or when people ask you to go out, uh, just the things that changed since you've been back home. Um, Because sometimes a lot of people have this perception that, you know, these combat veterans with PTSD are just lunatics, Mm -hmm. right? Right. They're crazy and they can't function right, Mm -hmm. which, you know, which very well could be the case for some, but not all. Right. Um, So talk to me about some of the things that you deal with, some of the things that maybe are hard for you to, to do or deal with, some of the things that make you anxious. Um, uh, so like for me, you know, um, crowds, like, uh, maybe a theme park kind of, that makes me anxious. Just been around people. Um, and that's very tough for me. It's something I obviously have to force myself to do, but I get, it makes me feel uncomfortable. It gets, I want to say easier. Some, some days are easier than others. Um. Movie theaters, kind of, you know, um, that's something that that's tough for me being out. Um, How about sleep? So, yeah, sleep is for, <laughs> sleep is a is a commodity for me. Um, there there are days that are very hard. I don't, you know, where I, you know, I don't get a lot of sleep. Sometimes sometimes I I can sleep. It just it just depends. You know, I find myself thinking about. Um, not so much the overall experiences I had in Iraq, but just those specific things that bother me that or that bother me that I shared. But, um, a huge thing I have is, believe it or not, is, um, a lot of people don't understand is, or they should understand is as survivors get like, you feel guilty for having made it through that. When there's guys that did not make it, and I feel like you know one of my we all all my buddies we all know them like we we we're all in this group chat together a uh, bunch of guys that served in the Marine Corps with but one of my he's a good friend Aaron Bass he was killed in Iraq and. I feel like he was the most squared away Marine I've ever met. Uh, a very good dude, humble dude. And it took me a while to admit this, but I feel like he's a better man than, than I am or ever will be. And I, I'm like, this guy got taken away, but I did not. And so for me, that, that bothers me sometimes. Like why? I'm not and not, not and not like I'm. I'm not saying I'm suicidal or I'm gonna go jump off of a bridge. But it just it's something that it's like one of my struggles. And just there's there's guys that that I think that didn't. And so that's like one of the things that, that I think that that combat veterans deal with. Or you know when I came back from Iraq from the first deployment. And I ended up um, doing a different, uh, doing a different job outside of the the infantry thing. My guys went to Fallujah, and I was trying my hardest to go. I, like these guys were over there, they're fighting guys that I that I trained with, and now they're getting shot up and killed, and and. Like that set heavy with me. It still does. Just to think, like, like one of my good friends, he got shot, and we had a conversation when he came back. He's like, Mike, I didn't trust anybody over there. He's like, Dude, I wish you were there with me. And that tore me up. Like that made me cry. Like I've cr- like that has made me cry at night. There are nights when I'm, I think about that, and I cry because that guy. He lost his fam when he came back. Just the PTSD thing. He got caught up in some stuff that some addiction. 
a porn addiction. I'm going to say it because I'm not going to say a name, but he got caught up in that and lost his whole family. But all stemmed from his PTSD. And so the way that I think about it is he got shot, but he tells me if, if you were there, maybe this wouldn't have happened type of conversation we had. Not he wasn't guilty me. He was just like genuinely. But for me, it's like as something that's very heavy. And that's the heaviest thing for I've, I don't share like people don't know. Do you know anybody that um, uh, do you have any friends that have taken their life since being back from war? Yep, uh, I have one of my um, one of my Marines. We did the whole combat tour together. He was one of my junior Marines, and then he got a. They put him in the you know to deal with the weapons, but he was in there, and they had he like tried to kill himself. He took a big knife and started slicing his arm up. Um, then we had another, another, another one of my buddies. I didn't deploy with them, but I served with them at a different duty station. Um, and he went to Iraq, came back and, uh, went through <laughs> VA getting medication, which seems like, I don't know, people probably hate me for this shit, but it seems like that's like. The, an answer here just take this take this take this take this so I believe like that on top of whatever whatever um, his issues on top of his medication on top of life and he ended up taking his life and it's like literally we I think we again he was in that group chat we literally talked to this guy that day and everything was good and then it's not good and that's just that's how it is like everything's good and then you're in a moment where it's not good and you're you're low and you feel low and you feel alone and nobody understands and so now like I get to those points in my life and I think back when I first got back I didn't realize why I was feeling like that. If I would have known, maybe I would have been able to navigate it and I would still have a marriage. And you would think that it would get easier. I was 2003, that's 18 years ago. But but yeah, this guy, I mean, you got to be, you have to be feeling really lonely. Like you, you, you get to the point where you're really lonely and and. And you have, like, I have friends, I have guys I can call anytime, but you get to, and I think it goes back to that being a Marine thing that you're ingrained, that's ingrained in you. And then the way I grew up and where I grew up, you got to be hard. So that's been part of my life, my whole life. You got to be hard. And I get to those moments, even now I get to those moments and I know I should call somebody and I don't. So I just fucking like, hey, I'm just going to suck it up. And I just feel like shit, but I withdraw from everything. But as time goes on, I'm I'm learning, you know, with therapy. I try to stay away from the medication spe specifically because of my friend's experience with the medication and how, ended, how his life ended. I try to stay away from it. But I'm getting better at being able to um, identify triggers, you know, certain situations, be a smell. Driving down the street, and you see something on the side of the road, and you're like, "Oh, that might be a, a whatever." Then you go back or a movie. So I'm getting better at identifying that stuff, so I can kind of get ahead of it and not go down that road where you know you're feeling alone or whatever. But if you were to compare being in combat to the aftermath of combat, what would you say is more difficult? Uh, one hundred percent. It's being here, being home, trying to be normal. 
Right. That that is more difficult. You know, when you're there, it's like, hey, that's the enemy. Go, go blow that shit up, and then eat and repeat. And you're you're at like a your alertness. You're like here, like all the time, right? So you don't have time to really focus on anything. You don't. You can't worry about anything. You're not worried about this relationship. You're not worried about whatever. But when you're home. And now you have time to think and you have to interact with people. You have to go to these places and you have to hear sounds, 4th of July, or you have to hear, you know, whatever. You can't control, you can't control what your, sometimes what your mind does or what, I guess, I'm not going to say what it does, but what's kind of put into it, right? So if I hear a sound, then my mind's going to automatically go back maybe to a certain memory. And now I have to deal with that while I'm supposed to be playing with my kid and focus on my or or focused on my school um like i got to like i i've I've failed college classes because there i hit those moments where i'm just like oh i feel real real low and alone and sad and i was like fuck this i'm not doing it and i failed classes so it's it's definitely harder it's trying to walk this path is you kind of you change they say people don't change but you I guess after you go through that you change you see you know people are evil but when you you're there you see how evil people really are and then you have to come back and look at people and you're like oh. it just kind of cracks something in you I guess um, how difficult has it been trying to get help uh, since being back? Uh, it's, it's it's tough. It's tough not because help is not available. Again, it goes back to that kind of oh, I don't need help. I'll just suck it up type of thing. So that's where it's tough at. It's tough to want to share how you're feeling to be vulnerable right nobody wants to be vulnerable especially an infantry marine <laughs> he doesn't want to be vulnerable he doesn't want to say hey i was wrong hey i should have whatever hey this makes me feel this way so that was tough it took it took me a long time it took me convincing by another buddy of mine he's a marine he wasn't an infantry marine but he was a marine and it took me a long time to even say, OK, I'm going to go get I'm going to go sit down and talk to someone after my marriage fell apart. After I had kind of, I guess, lost my family, so to speak. And even then, when you're there, you're kind of sitting there you're, the first time you're talking to this guy sitting across from you, and you're you're sizing him up. You know, you're like, all right, this dude has got his, his degree. OK, you've read a couple books like <laughs> I don't know you. Like, why? Why am I gonna sit here and so? And that's what it, you know, like, just in general, I guess, just talking to people in general. But I just, I don't know. That is, it was tough. And once you, but once you find that person you can trust, I guess, then it kind of it makes it easier. But it's still tough. Like I said, sometimes you sit there and you know you should reach out to someone and you don't. What would you say to um, anyone else that's in your position? Maybe that's, you know, somebody that's been through war, combat, feeling down, feeling like there's no purpose to life. Uh, you know, what would you say to them? Well, I would... I would say um, that you know these the it's gonna be tough. Times are gonna be hard. Those moments, it's kind of like, and every Marine can, any Marine, infantry or not, can identify with this. When you're boot camp, you lived from meal to meal. That's how you survived your day. 
because it was sometimes so overwhelming. You're just like, all right, I, I just got to make it to lunch, made it to lunch. Or I just got to make it to dinner. And so my that I mean, that's what I would say is like in those moments, you just have to make it to the next moment. And that moment is not going to kill you. The only thing that's going to hurt you in that moment is yourself. That moment is going gonna, is gonna to hurt your heart, your mind, probably fucking go crazy. But that moment won't kill you. It won't hurt you. And there's a lot of guys that have been in that moment and, and made it through. And I would say, you know, got to find something to kind of... Try to take your mind. You'll never be able to really, I I can't take my mind completely off of it, but a hobby or something that drives you. Something that drives you. What have you found that helps you? um, (laughs) I've got several things. I smoke cigars. I wish I could smoke one during this interview. but Show that one up. Smoke cigars. Um... Ride motorcycles, uh, box, working out, and I do uh, stand-up comedy. That's probably one one of the biggest ones because I get to, I I like making people laugh, but I make people laugh with my story, with, with my hurts, the things that I've been through, and it just make it helps me to help people, to see people laugh. So that's my, that's what I find. So when I get in, when I'm, when I start to get in my moments, I for sure I'm going to light up a cigar. That's my first thing. And then if, if it's late for me, my moments always when they come 12, one, two o'clock in the morning. So I'm not getting on a motorcycle at two in the morning or I'm not going to the gym there. Sometimes I will go to the gym, but I will write. What am I thinking? What are what are my tears thinking, you know, if I'm crying? And then I'll try to turn that into a punchline. All right. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. Is, uh, you know, you have any last words, anything you want to say before we wrap it up? Um, no, not, I mean, for, for any veteran that, that's, seeing this that's struggling you're not alone you know and for anyone anyone that's not a veteran that really doesn't understand um it takes a lot of fucking i would i would encourage you to kind of maybe get to know if you have a person like that in your life to kind of get to know them don't let them kind of open up to you but don't my God, this dude's a fucking weirdo. Write, write him off. So that's, you know, if I would get any advice or say anything. It takes a lot of balls to sit in this chair like this and do this interview. Be vulnerable. It's hard. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no way I'm coming back.